In 467 BC, citizens of Athens went to the theater to see a performance of Seven Against Thebes. The play was written by Aeschylus. It was set in a distant legendary past from before the Trojan War, when seven kings assaulted Thebes. The Athenian audience watched as the character Ediocles, the Theban ruler, received the news from his scout that seven warriors had been placed before the city's seven gates to launch an attack. The scout then describes these warriors, and the first five of them are vicious and connive towards terror in their aspect, carrying shields wrought with various symbols of aggression. But the sixth king is described as a man of the highest virtue. He questions what claim of justice gives them a good reason to prosecute the war. His shield has no image on it. The scout says of this character, he desires not the appearance of excellence, but the reality, harvesting a deep furrow in his mind from which good counsels grow. When the Athenian audience listened to the description of this man, Plutarch writes, the eyes of all the spectators turned on Aristides, as if this virtue in an especial manner belonged to him. For Plutarch writes of Aristides, of all his virtues, the common people were most affected with his justice because of its continual and common use. And thus, although of mean fortune and ordinary birth, he possessed himself of the most kingly and divine appellation of just. And Plutarch continues to say that in justice and equity, nothing participates except by means of reason and the knowledge of that which is divine. And of all the endowments of human character, Plutarch writes, virtue, the only divine good really in our reach, is the trait least possessed and least pursued. It makes Aristides a unique figure in the parallel lives. He had been one of the generals of the Battle of Marathon back in 490 BC. And after the fighting was over, we get an example of the trust that was placed in him. When the battlefield was littered with Persian spoils, it was Aristides who was left behind to keep an eye on them because the bulk of the army had to return to Athens in great haste because the city was undefended. And Plutarch relates, Aristides, being left with his tribe at Marathon to guard the plunder, did not disappoint the opinion they had of him. Amidst the profusion of gold and silver, all sorts of apparel and other property, he neither felt the desire to meddle with anything himself, nor suffer others to do it. So it is not just that the Athenians trusted him not to take anything. They trusted him to prevent others from taking anything. And this next story is, is interesting too. Before the Battle of Salamis, Plutarch writes, In the council of war, Cleocritus the Corinthian, telling Themistocles that Aristides did not like his advice as he was present and said nothing, Aristides answered that he should not have held his peace if Themistocles had not been giving the best advice. This shows us that people would wonder what Aristides was thinking, and that if you spoke in front of him, something intangible about him gave you a preference for saying things that were in accordance with his sense of right and wrong. And it could have been lines like those we just read, which prompted Michel de Montaigne to quote Seneca as follows. Let true ideals be kept before your mind. Keep ever in your mind Cato, Phocion, and Aristides, in whose presence even fools would hide their faults. People were afraid to be stupid or obviously greedy around Aristides. Now, of the political opposition between himself and and Themistocles. We're going to have to get to Athenian politics in a later video, but Aristotle writes this about them. Athens was well governed in these periods. The heads of the people were Aristides and Themistocles, the latter practicing to be skillful in military pursuits and the former in politics, and to excel his contemporaries in justice. So having acquired this reputation as being just, over time it caused people to envy him. And the sentence of ostracism would be passed against Aristides. And it's interesting to think about exactly why. And Plutarch writes, Themistically spread a rumor amongst the people that by determining and judging all matters privately, he, as in Aristides, had destroyed the courts of judicature 
and was secretly making way for a monarchy in his own person. So all Aristides was doing was acting like a private mediator and that because of his reputation for justice, whenever a dispute broke out between two people, they'd go to him rather than the courts. Now, if litigants were to do that nowadays, no one would care. Plenty of private mediators, judges love it, it takes cases off their docket, and no individual citizens are offended by it, obviously. So why did the Athenians care so much? It is probably because they coveted their role as jurors, which again sounds odd to us, but they did. As Plutarch had told us in his life of Solon, the role of juror was a great power. And he had said, at first it seemed nothing, but afterwards was found an enormous privilege, as almost every matter of dispute came before them in this latter capacity. The people had control over all the legal outcomes. Aristotle writes that the chief basis of the powers of the multitude was the right of appeal to the jury court. And he also wrote that the jury court is the umpire in all business, both public and private. There must have been a unique environment in Athens where people would involve themselves in every public drama that erupted into the courts. And some of the people were addicted to their power as jurors. As we find in The Wasps by Aristophanes, two slaves are guarding the home of their master, and one of them explains, The master's sickness is addiction to jury service and the world's worst case. That's his passion, judging. So... If the power and privilege of the people was bound up in their ability to serve as jurors and judges over their fellow citizens, they thought Aristides was a threat to that. And so Plutarch writes, coming together, therefore, from all parts into the city, they banished Aristides, giving their jealousy of his reputation the name of fear of tyranny. So it was no fun that he was known as the just and no one wanted to air out their legal disputes to the idiotic justice of the general public. So Aristides had to go. Plutarch tells us a story from the process. Everyone taking an ostracon, a shard, that is, or piece of earthenware, wrote upon it the citizen's name he would have banished, and carried it to a certain part of the marketplace surrounded with wooden rails. So maybe this is the origin of a certain expression about being driven out of town. Plutarch continues, an illiterate, clownish fellow, giving Aristides his shard, supposing him a common citizen, begged him to write Aristides upon it. And he being surprised and asking if Aristides had ever done him any injury. None at all, said he. Neither know I the man, but I am tired of hearing him everywhere called the just. Aristides, hearing this, is said to have made no reply, but returned the shard with his own name inscribed. But his banishment would be recalled during the Persian invasion. As we've already seen, he was present for a Greek war council prior to the Battle of Salamis. And during the fight, he took part in the storming of a Persian-held island. But ten months after that battle, a Persian army under Mardonius came down from Thessaly on the campaign which would result in the Battle of Plataea at a time when Athens had already been burned down by Xerxes. Plutarch writes, he, as in Mardonius, sent privately to the Athenians, both by letter and word of mouth from the king, promising to rebuild their city, to give them a vast sum of money, and constitute them lords of all Greece, on condition they were not engaged in the war. The Lacedaemonians receiving news of this, and fearing, dispatched an embassy to the Athenians, entreating that they would send their wives and children to Sparta, and receive support from them for their superannuated. The response to both of these from Aristides was this, Plutarch continues. They returned an answer, upon the motion of Aristides, worthy of the highest admiration, declaring that they forgave their enemies if they thought all things purchasable by wealth, than which they knew nothing of greater value, but that they felt offended at the Lacedaemonians for looking only at their present poverty and exigence, without remembrance of their valor and magnanimity. The Athenians, under the rule of Aristides, could not be paid by the Persians to avoid danger. But his reaction to the Lacedaemonians is even more interesting, as in how dare you assume that we are morally compromised just because we are currently impoverished, and how dare you attempt to exploit our necessitousness to subdue us under the aegis of your political power. This is what we would call leadership. 
And now we can finally turn to a commentary on the character of Aristides. In the instance we have just described, he has shown his virtues as a leader, fulfilling that duty of leadership as described in The Suppliants, another play by Aeschylus. When confronted with the possibility of war, the King Pelasgius, seeking only to avoid conflict because his fear of a negative outcome outweighs his sense of what is the right thing to do, he is chastised by the chorus. You are the city, I tell you. You are the people. A head of state, not subject to judgment. You control the altar, the hearth of the city. And the implication, I think, is that the leader of a city is responsible not only for the physical safety of the people, but for their souls, in the sense that each is either tainted or improved by the justice of the city's policies. That the people of Athens, in placing their confidence in Aristides, granted him that power to make the harder choice, turning down Persian money and Spartan support. And even though the suggestion to do that came from Aristides, once it became Athenian policy, its virtue belonged to the whole city. And no matter with what steadfastness of spirit each individual was born, every citizen's soul alike could find its honor nourished by the joint exercise of a worthy act. When the greatness of a leader's virtues are transmitted in the deeds of the governed, this is the condition to be called excellence in government. So if it is the purpose of state policy to get all people to behave virtuously, no matter what their natural bent is, it is for philosophy to wonder from where virtue springs in the first place. Where does the virtuous impulse come from? Now, returning to that line from the suppliants, the chorus had told Pelasgius that he is the altar and the hearth of the city. What I think is meant by these words, altar and hearth, is that the altar is representative of the outward ceremonial life of the city, whereas the hearth is representative of the inner domestic life of the private individual. And the Greek word that Aeschylus uses, that is translated as hearth, is estion, which is interesting because when Plutarch had discussed the nature of virtue and how it is the only divine good that it is within our reach, the word that is translated as good is esti, this root word for hearth. It signals to us that Plutarch and Aeschylus believe that true virtues spring from within metaphorically as though they are the produce of the domestic hearth and are not the result of any social imprint. Pindar seems to agree with this. He writes in Olympia number 2, The wise man knows many things in his blood. The vulgar are taught. They will say anything. And to close this point out, we will mention Plato's Symposium. When Socrates, in a speech, tells them about a conversation he had about love, with a Manitaean woman named Diotima, in which she says to him, There are persons who in their souls, still more than in their bodies, conceive those things which are proper for the soul to conceive and bring forth. And what are those things? Prudence and virtue in general. And in concluding, Socrates says, This is what Diotima told me, and I am persuaded of it. (laughs) 